Hello there, everybody. Welcome back to Star Wars Lads for our third review in the Rogue Squadron series of X-Wing books. We're going to be talking about the Kratos Trap. As with the previous two videos, this will be a non-spoiler review for the plot of the Kratos Trap. But we are going to be talking spoilers in our first live Star Wars Legends book club episode. It's going to be happening on December 11th. So make sure you mark your calendar and join us if you're interested in talking X-Wing. We will be talking about all four books in the Rogue Squadron series. Get about a month to refresh yourself and read the rest of the books and catch up. And then come and join us and talk full spoilers. Talk about some of your favorite things that happen in this series. Uh, we're really looking forward to it. That's going to be the future of Legends Book Club. We'll do these non-spoiler reviews and then we'll do a full spoiler review where we can talk to all of you live. So make sure you join us for that. And without further ado, let's just get in to the review here. And we're going to start with the plot, the writing, and the story construction, the way the story is told, the way Michael Stackpole wrote this. This is the third book, so he has a style kind of set out here. Senek, when you look at the Kratos Trap, the way it was plotted, the way it was written, what did you think of it overall? Honestly, this is probably my favorite of the four, the initial four books from Michael Stackpole. This is very much an investigative, almost procedural book. Logistics kind of start playing a little bit more of a bigger role here. Not as much as the next book per se, but it, it, it's still really, really fun to see how the story kind of crafts three very different narratives and then kind of ties them all together here. I think obviously you have storyline but Corrin, who's presumed dead by everyone in the Rogue Squadron, and that does directly lead into why Tycho, with all the suspicions around him and what he Corrin sees in the last book on Coruscant, that he's the one who last fixed up Corrin's ship and caused him to die in this insane crash. But it's not true because Corrin is alive and he's in the worst place possible for a rebellion hero to be the Lusankyo, you know, the the flagship of the Ice Heart herself, and it's it's a storyline that on its own probably wouldn't have been great, but because it's so intrinsically tied to what we're seeing real time happening with Tycho in his case and how Rogue Squadron's kind of backing him up, obviously with Wedge's support, uh, with Navarro and finally getting to show off his lawyer skills, right? So th that was pretty interesting for me. But then the third storyline is how the Kratos virus is really put into play here. And this is the book where you get to see that it's not just a virus to just knock out the rebellion. It's one to put them against each other, the infighting, how it's only affecting certain species and not affecting humans, which is a huge, huge plot point for them. And you get to see how rebellion leaders like Leia and everyone else are trying to come into play here and figure out how are we going to balance out the emotions and almost this like anti-human sentiment that is obviously coming up here and then at the same time you get to have our villains kind of play a little bit of a role in trying to make this mutate a little further increasingly get worse flood the market with back to pull back when they need to it's it's a really interesting story of push and pull all around for all these storylines corin is obviously trying to escape he doesn't win all the time but he learns a little bit more taiko's case is not going so hot but you get to see the rebellions heroes under the rogue squadron do certain things that you know kind of push them towards a situation or maybe they can figure things out maybe we can delay the case maybe we can put taiko in a better situation all around and i i found that really interesting i think if i'd read this book of when i was a little younger i probably would have found a lot of like the case itself pretty boring but seeing how well it ties into the other two storylines was a pretty strong treat for me and i definitely liked a lot of the subplots i think like the gavin and asir subplot uh, especially with Borsk and how he kind of plays into that story uh, they're two characters that have been growing and I really like their dynamic and it comes and really flourishes in the story here and I really like everything that's going on on Ryloth and how they can be a much bigger player than initially presented here with just Noara and I thought that's where you get to see some of the cool stuff from the comics and kind of play a little bit more of a bigger role here you get to see Wedge and see just how far and willing he is to prove his point to help out his friend. I think the subplots really elevated all three of the storylines here. So yeah, I mean, I think this is probably the best written of the four for me. 
Yeah, this is a certainly an interesting novel in the series where Rogue Squadron is so high flying and has so much action. Wedge's Gamble takes a bit of a step back from the action in its middle act, but it has high flying action in its beginning and its end. But it has an espionage style story, which is still, you know, kind of in the action genre. The Kratos Trap is a complete political thriller. This is a courtroom drama, but also a prison story. And it's both terrifying, but also a lot slower burn. This is a story that is built on the backs of its characters. And this is the one where you really get to see the rest of Rogue Squadron flourish. Now that you got Corn Horn in a separate plot point, you have chapters from other people's POVs that aren't Corn Horn and aren't Wedge Antilles. And that does open up the X-Wing series, especially the Rogue Squadron series, to all new perspectives and all new thoughts. Just like you were mentioning with the Krytos virus, it targeting non-humans, continuing off of Wedge's gambles, distrust between the Empire and the non-humans on Coruscant, and now with New Republic, controlling Coruscant, that continued distrust, some of the seeds that Characters like Kirtan Lore and other militia groups are starting to lay throughout the city. This is a very layered, multifaceted political thriller. I think Stackpole mostly handles it extremely well. Uh, to me, at times, the multiple plot lines can cause this book to move a little bit slower than the other books. It certainly is not as fast paced or exciting as the previous two. But that slow burn, I think, pays off with how strong its characters are overall. There's a lot of building here. Uh, there's a lot of building in the plot as well to the overall conclusion that we get and back to war. And in some ways, this book can feel like a setup book, but its character work is strong enough, I think, like once again, that I think it does overcome it. So if you are somebody coming into this, you're like, I just read the Battle of Course on what happens next. This is certainly a slowdown. You're not going to get the next massive f action scene until deeper in the story. And then a lot of the action is really saved for the next book. But talking about those characters, this is a character book. And you alluded to quite a few earlier in, in the previous section. But you have so many characters who all of a sudden come out of of you know the shadows and really stand in the spotlight uh noir event obviously being kind of the big one here but uh, we still do have corin and wedge and mirax and all of those characters with big prevalent plot lines as well as Tycho, who's now on trial for his life needing to really solidify himself as a big character in this series once again. Sonic, what did you think overall of the way the characters were written throughout this novel, and uh, which were your favorites throughout the story? This was definitely a return to form for me for Curtin Lore. I did like that the position that he was in for Iceheart was pretty interesting. It is a little bit more logistics driven, and that's where he kind of started even before these books. So seeing how he applied that with his newer lessons, with the dynamics that he's putting in play here, I thought it was pretty cool. I was pretty surprised that he makes such an extraordinary gamble in this book, especially with the whole specter of Warlord Zinge. And it's, I mean, I'm not trying to spoil it. It doesn't really pay off the way he expects to. And I, I think what is kind of sad is that he had become really fascinating to me again in this book after kind of being stuck in the middle of a lot more interesting or like messed up imperial villains he got to stand on his own two feet again he has a very interesting ending uh, it's not one that i was expecting but i think for what was being built up it made sense i mean izard she doesn't have a lot of moments but she, it, she does definitely have some really maniacal intentions that really come through here Corn is great here. You know, he gets to meet older people like Jan, who's stuck on this Lusankia and get to see like how he's working with old rebel heroes who've been trapped for years and years and how he's trying to figure out how to leave and get out here. And I mean, that whole journey itself is fascinating, but like you see the resolve of the character. And then when he finally makes that first big leap, that's when it gets like really interesting of like, where has he stumbled into? What is he actually doing? A lot of twists and turns for a story that I think kind of play more into that heroic angle that isn't necessarily there in that second book and isn't feeling very tropish like that first one. 
And like I said, I think Asir, she was pretty interesting um, when we, she first got introduced. But now that you get to see her formally working under a new Republic entity with that personal relationship with Gavin, you got to see some really interesting dynamics at play here. And I thought that was great because that's one thing that this Rogue Squadron book does is they put a big highlight on the aliens. And she's one of the better examples for sure. Absolutely. The aliens are at the forefront here. Uh, Noir Vin, to me, is the big standout of this novel. He's one of my favorite characters in this book. And he becomes one of my favorite supplementary Rogue Squadron characters, where he's a good part of the first two. He's a great part of this book. Being the lawyer of Rogue Squadron, he has a massive role in this story. And I really did appreciate what he was given especially in a story that deals so closely with the human versus alien dynamics. I thought he was great. Uh, Tycho also is a massive standout. I thought Tycho was great in this book and the way his journey continues to unfold, whether he's innocent or guilty, that works really well uh, because of Wedge's close relationship with Tycho. Wedge also has some really strong moments. And then Mirax continues to shine, especially post Corrin disappearing you you get a lot of mirax in the story and that is also quite interesting like you said asir and gavin that storyline continues to work really well and starts to build towards some payoff but everybody just seems to have some strong time to shine isard is also good in this book kirtan lore's coruscant militias are also working really interestingly uh, the way this connects back to kind of the imperial heart of Coruscant the way it's so connected to the fiber of what the empire is and also Palpatine and using his name to bolster a lot of the things that go on in this book I thought were also very very strong and uh, the return of Jan Dodona I thought was awesome I really liked the character at first it kind of seemed like a bit of a gimmick but uh, overall, I thought he worked really, really well. And Corrin works really well here. Uh, I think there are some things towards the end of the book that certainly are typical legends sometimes jump the shark stuff. It works because I like the character of Corrin. I feel like if this was a new book that I hadn't had a lot of nostalgia for, I don't know how I would be feeling about the things he does. But overall... I think it, it plays out in a way that's relatively restrained. Korn's a character with flaws and those flaws and his strengths show in equal measure. Uh, he's not somebody who is just out of nowhere, incredibly different uh, without spoiling anything <laughs> to the umph degree. But he has, he has his strengths and weaknesses and I think they're used well throughout the end, even if I've always found the way the book ends a little quick for a, a plot point that kind of comes out of nowhere even if it is set up just a little bit throughout the series so we're going to wrap up our review with a score out of five sonic what would you rate the Kratos trap out of five like i said this is my favorite of the four this is the strongest book for me i think this is the one that where you get to see stackpole really juggle the genre conventions and what he's really trying to do with the plot and the character progressions I loved all the subplots. I think this is probably the book that handles its subplots the strongest. And it is definitely continued in Back to War, but I think that's pretty much mastered here. So for that reason and for that insane ending that happens, I have to give this a four. I do really enjoy this book as well. It's very different amongst the not just the Rogue Squadron series, but the entirety of the X-Wing 10 book series. This is one of the more unique books. It does put a lot of emphasis on the side characters, which does help build the stakes for the finale. The villains are great. It does have a strong finale and it adds and improves the characters we already did like. There's not too many things I have as a negative about this, other than I do think it is a little bit slower paced at times. It can be a little bit more of a drag to read. But if you're invested by now with these characters and with this story, this is another really strong addition. I would also give this a four out of five. It's a really strong book and certainly worth your time. Make sure you check out our reviews for Wedge's Gamble and Rogue Squadron and stay tuned for our review for The Back to War. We will have that review out to you as soon as possible. And make sure you mark your calendar down for Legends Book Club, December 11th. We'll be talking about all four of these books in full spoilers. Hopefully you guys all join us then live. Thank you so much for watching this video, and we will see you all next time.